Good afternoon and welcome to this Chemistry World webinar. I'm Ben Valsler, Chemistry World's digital editor. The other person you can see on screen is Rachel Dance, who is doing British Sign Language interpretation for anybody here who needs it. If you do need to take advantage of Rachel's services, then you will be able to move the webcams around on your screen, put it where you need it, enlarge it, and really make the most of it. We're delighted to have Rachel with us. Thank you, Rachel, for joining us. Now, today's webinar is the second in a series looking at plastics and some of the big questions surrounding plastics. And we've developed this series in partnership with the policy group at the Royal Society of Chemistry. So I'll hand over very soon to Cathy Page, who's a program manager for environment in the policy unit. Uh, but first of all, I'd just like to let you know how you can find the previous webinar in this series. So we're going to share a link in the chat function of GoToWebinar now. If you missed that one, you'll easily be able to go back and watch that. We've actually made the video available to all so you can just watch that video straight away. But the real reason you're here today in the interactive live webinar is so that you can ask questions and we can learn a bit more about you as an audience and hopefully uh, get you the answers that you want. So go to webinar itself, depending on what platform you're in, and likely got a chat box down at the bottom. It's probably a panel on the right hand side of your screen and there's a box at the bottom there where you can ask questions. And I can see already that there are good questions and comments coming in. So if you have any questions at any time throughout the presentations, get those in there, and we'll come to the Q&A after our two guest presenters today. You may also be wondering if you'll be able to catch up with this if you miss it later. Well, just like the last one in the series, we'll be making the video available completely to the public. That means we don't share the slides from this presentation because we think the context of the slides and what's being said is far more important than just a slide deck itself. So you'll be able to watch that recording. We'll send you a link to that in your inbox to everybody who registered. And for those of you who attend live, we'll also send you in the same email a certificate. That's just our way of saying thanks is through that certificate of attendance. So that's all you really need to know about how to interact with our guest speakers today. But to let you know a bit more about the topic we're covering and who those guest speakers are, I'd now like to introduce Cathy. Now, Cathy is, as I said, program manager for environment for the science policy unit at the RSC. She's been working with us to develop this entire series. She's found our excellent guests. She knows these topics inside out, and she's been working on developing the explainers that go into these topics in a bit more detail. She'll let you know more about those. Cathy, thank you for joining us. Thanks so much, Ben. Hello, everyone, and thank you all for joining us. Um, so first, I know it's a bit more difficult to get a sense of the audience virtually, but we're really amazed to see over 1,700 people signed up for this webinar from all over the world, from the UK to Switzerland, Indonesia, Italy, Ghana, Algeria, Thailand, and so many more. So welcome along, everybody. As Ben mentioned, my name is Cathy Page. I am Programme Manager in the Science Policy Unit here at the Royal Society of Chemistry. For those who don't know, the Royal Society of Chemistry represents chemists in the UK and worldwide, with over 45,000 members across academia, industry, government and other sectors. Our policy team works to make sure the best science and chemistry is available for decision makers. And today we're exploring the world of plastic recycling and specifically chemical recycling. So how does recycling work? How could it be better? And where do the technologies known as chemical recycling fit in? what does the future look like for a circular economy for plastic? So we know that plastics provide many benefits to society, but our throwaway model of consumption has led to a vast amount of pollution in our natural environment. In order to sustainably capture the benefits of this material, we should first reduce our plastic consumption and then move towards a circular system with a focus on reuse and recycling of products. This both acts to reduce the pollution and also avoids the carbon cost of producing new plastics. So many of us may not have thought about where our waste goes if we even have access to recycling infrastructure, but it's worth exploring the options for the best way to retain value in plastics and design a future system to be as sustainable as possible. The RSC has been publishing and promoting research around plastics for a long time. And over the last few years, we've moved into work around waste policy, including our policy work on plastics. You may want to check out our current explainers, as Ben alluded to, online. Um, they cover the topics of biodegradability and degradation of plastics. And our website also has um, our policy position, extensive journals, our report on science to enable sustainable plastics, along with our other sustainability work. 
And our new explainers, um, looking at plastics recycling itself, will be available from the end of August. Um, we also have a new podcast all about plastics coming soon, so do look out for those in the future. But today, we're having this webinar to hear from some experts about recycling, um, bring a bit of nuance to the debate around plastics, and hopefully answer a lot of your questions. With that in mind, we really want to hear from you. So please do ask those questions at any point, and we'll have lots of time to discuss those with our speakers in the second part of today's webinar. We've got two really excellent speakers for you today. Coming up a bit later, we've got Dr. Ina Volmer, who is Assistant Professor of Chemistry at Utrecht University. But first up, Dr. Sam Hill, who is the Head of Technical and Innovation at Bright Green Plastics. Sam has previously worked in the formulation and process development of flexible PVC materials and has a PhD in electrically conductive polymers, so knows a thing or two about polymers and plastics. Sam is going to talk to us about mechanical recycling and some of the ways that it can be improved. So over to you, Sam. Hello, uh, thank you for the introduction, Cathy. I'm hoping my screen is now shared. Um, yeah, I suppose on that final slide that we saw there, it said I was head of quality. My job title changed literally minutes ago. Um, so yeah, I'm the head of technical and innovation here. Um, Bright Green Plastics are a, a recycler of thermoplastics, polyethylene and polypropylene, and we have just recently been awarded an award for excellence, as in the best recycler in the UK. Um, so that was something we were proud to receive last week. So I'm here to try and give an overview of the mechanical recycling of polyethylene and polypropylene, and it's, um, it's an enormous topic, and five minutes is nowhere near enough to go through anything really in depth. Um, but I'm hoping when I finish, you'll have a bit more of an understanding to then see how chemical recycling may take this um, topic further. So we are a relatively small site in Castleford, just outside Leeds, if you can tell by my accent. Um, we have around 150 employees. We can recycle up to around 40,000 tonnes of polypropylene and polyethylene. We have our own polymer recovery facility here which means we can sort uh, mixed plastics waste from households. So we are um, taking in a lot of waste from the Wakefield Council area and others around the UK. And we take material, as you can see on the, this aerial shot, we've got lots of cubes of mixed waste plastic, and we ultimately convert them into a formulated pellet that can be colored, it can be um, have particular additives um, included there to, to meet a requirement for injection molders and extruders around the UK. So we'll, we'll just quickly dive in um, really and look at what the challenges are um, in a mechanical recycling business. Um, the photographs you see there are ultimately a representation of our raw materials and the one in the top right is how a mixed plastic bale will be um, delivered to us. So you can see in there, there's a mixture of every plastic, every kind of packaging type. And the first challenge for us is to be able to separate that effectively. So we want to separate that by um, polymer type, um, but also to try and remove any contaminants. And contaminants for us can mean papers, fibers, card. It can mean metals. It can mean shoes <laughs> in some cases. Um, so we, we have to try and employ particular sorting methods to remove all these issues and to remove the different plastic types um, so as to create a better product at the end. And one other thing we need to consider is that we currently sort by polymer type. And while that's fantastic, we have to understand the different uses of each of these polymer types and uh, the packaging which you know that we receive. So I've put two uh, examples for each each um, polymer type HDPE we generally see them in milk bottles or perhaps bleach bottles household chemicals and um, polypropylene is generally used in butter tubs and trays and, and food crates and while these are the same polymer they have very different physical properties so it's important in a mechanical recycling um, environment that we have to be able to manage this to homogenize these properties well but also have a, a consideration of the color of the finished products also. So the, the challenges that we have are really homogenization and the removal of contamination. And we homogenize 
in three, four different steps, depending on how you count it throughout our process. We try to homogenize by um, ultimately mixing waste through the plastic sorting um, step. We ultimately create about a, a two and a half meter tall pile of waste plastic um, before that is then added to our wash process, the washing granulation, which is um, a way of us removing content, but I'll get onto that later. So we wash and granulate into flakes about 14 millimetres in width. Um, and then we also blend this, these flakes in fountain blenders um, before they enter an extruder. In the extruder, obviously, this is melted and mixed within the flights of the extruder. And at the outlet, again, these finished pellets are blended once more. This is everything we can do, really. It's, it's all a physical process in order to manage the properties of um, the polymers that we use. So to remove contamination, I've mentioned we use um, NIR sorting technology. So these are different sorting heads, which are um, you know, quite ubiquitous really in the materials waste and the waste handling environments. We then have the float sink operation. And we're rather lucky um, in, our, um, in our process, polyethylene and polypropylene float. And that is a fantastic way for us to remove any and other um, metals, other plastics, other materials. It's, it's a brilliant way for us, nice and simple. Um, but then eventually we, when we process, I tried to put a photograph on there. It's, it's probably hard to describe in the time we've got, but we use melt filtration in our extrusion processes. And the image there is of a continuous disc filter, um, which is always rotating. It's always self wiping. So that helps us to remove things like unmelt, such as silicones or perhaps PET contamination preventing the back pressure from forming and ultimately forcing that material through into our physical uh, into our finished product. So we'll then move on to the issue of compatibility. And while PE and PP both float, we can't separate them that way. Um, NIR also struggles to, to separate them. And these photographs don't quite show as well, unfortunately, in, in, in a photograph on a screen. But the image on the left is an example of a wheelie bin, which has been um compatibilized in a traditional way um, in order to accept polypropylene contamination within and this issue is generally referred to as tiger stripes so you can sort of see some push marks from the injection molding process where ultimately you, you start to observe pp rich areas within the polyethylene uh, bulk um, and then a photograph on the right again it's i apologize um, but this is something that we've achieved using our compatibilizer that um, we use on our site, um, and I'll probably go on to describe that a bit more now. Um, but compatibility, as well as um, just a visual defect, it can cause severe detriment to your physical properties. Um, a wheeler bin, which is normally HDPE, if there is too high a proportion of polypropylene or vice versa, this material will fracture, it will crack, and ultimately it will just be destroyed in any use. So we have to do everything we can to avoid this failure. So I'm going to try and quickly go through compatibilization as well. And the, the image on the left, the SEM micrograph, you can see, you can see it's performed with Emery's. We were once at Emery's business. Um, but the, the photograph on the left is trying to look at a fracture zone of a, a test piece, which has been compatibilized with some of the typical compatibilizers you can find on the market, such as Infuse, these olefinic block coal polymers, um, compatibilizers. And what they do is try to act as um, a surfactant uh, when you try to deal with an oil in water. Um, and you can see at the break fracture, you just have these little um, kind of features which just demonstrate you've just got little islands of unconnected bits of plastic, uh, to put it very basically. And at the break, it's very soft, it's very brittle, um, so it doesn't take much energy at all to break it. Whereas what we try to employ is a reactive compatibilization mechanism. So we don't try to deal with just trying to almost form micelles within the polymer structure. We look to have a material with uh, reactive ends based on a calcium carbonate filler. And we can then see really from physical properties, but also from this visual um, perspective that we get fibrils. So once we try to pull this material apart, you can see there is bonding between these polymers and we are getting stretching and destruction in the um, physical structure that way. So I think then what we'll move on to, you know, I've tried to cover some challenges and I think now we need to look at 
the market, the re what's facing us recyclers really. Um, this is from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. Um, it's probably a year or so old, but I bet it's still very relevant today. What we can see is that there's these um, large manufacturers who rely on packaging to sell their goods. You can see that they have always been pretty open really about the recycled content of their packaging. And you see that not one of these examples is over 10%. Now, if you imagine, if you ignore the company's particular targets for 2025 or 2030, packaging in the UK must contain 30% recycled content next year. And you can see just an idea of the volume of recycled plastic that is going to be required across Europe, across the world, um, in order to fulfil just these people's requirements. Um, and this is really what we need to focus on as a, as a nation and the whole waste management infrastructure. Here's uh, some data from the BPF where we look at really how we can try and pick up this slack. Where do we get this material from? And the line at the top is ultimately the tonnage of plastic waste that we export every year. And you can see it's been growing steadily and ultimately it's, it's disappointing. Um, someone like me, we want that graph to be the other way around. We want us to be reprocessing as much of our plastic waste as possible within the UK, because this is raw material which we are ultimately losing to the system. And when you lose it to the system, when you export, there's a chance you can find um, mishandling of plastic waste in other nations. Um, and ultimately that could lead to pollution. And despite being in the plastics industry, that's not something I want to see. Um, so I think the, the more we keep material in-house, the better we can handle that as we go forward. So you can see ultimately we are losing approximately 700,000 tonnes of plastic waste to exports, and that's a shame. And then this last slide really is to look at the future of recycling. This is from BPF's um, recycling roadmap. So we try to look at the position we are in today versus the position we expect to be in or what we should try to pursue um, over the next 10 years. And what we try to demonstrate here is that in 2020, there's very little use of chemical recycling. You can see we've got bars there explaining what is currently composted or anaerobically digested, um, how much material is sent for burning ultimately for energy from waste, what kind of recycling methods there are, and then some exports. So you can see both mechanical and chemical recycling must grow in its capacity, but you can see the estimations here have shown chemical recycling in, improving massively, but it's only from 5,000 tonnes up to three, 300,000 tonnes over um, the next 10 years, whereas mechanical recycling is going to grow from 750,000 tonnes up to 2,300,000 tonnes. <laughs> it's incredible numbers. Um, but this is pretty much where we expect to go. And ultimately what this is reducing is the amount to be exported um, but additionally, less material being lost to landfill. And that's something we, we should all um, be pursuing. Um, and that's pretty much the end of my slides. Um, thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much for inviting me to talk, Cathy. Um, and I look forward to any questions at the end. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Sam. Yeah, if you could please stick around, um, we'll be asking you some more questions a little bit later. But first, we're going to hear from Ina Volma. As I mentioned, Ina is an assistant professor at Utrecht University Institute for Sustainable and Circular Chemistry. Her work focuses on developing pathways for low temperature selective chemical recycling of plastic waste, particularly using catalysis to drive depolymerization. She'll be talking us through some chemical recycling technologies. Um, thanks so much for joining us, Ina. Over to you. Yeah, thanks a lot for introducing me. I'm really excited to be here and uh, talk about um, chemical recycling. Um, yeah, so what we actually want to achieve with chemical recycling is kind of reversing the polymer making process ideally. So the question is whether um, with some scientific advantage uh, and some technical technological advances, we can um, make the phoenix rise again from the, the plastic waste. Um, so first, I would like to talk a bit about where that fit in, fits in. So we, we are always talking about this, um, this uh, 
yeah, polymer making chain if we want to reverse it. So where we start at the moment is we, we start from crude oil, um, then we go to the refinery or the steam cracker to make the monomers, which are then polymerized to make the polymers, um, which uh, form the resin, and those are formed into um, the products that we use as consumers. Uh, when we use them, then they will end up at waste as waste at, at some point, especially packaging has a very short lifetime. So they will reach the collection, separation and sorting. And some of it um, will then be um, recycled. Uh, some of it will then go to landfill or incineration. And only a very, very small fraction at the moment uh, is mechanical recycle. So that is, of course, needs to grow. Um, but the question is also, can we uh, use some other technologies to uh, not use crude oil anymore to make polymers and to stop landfilling and incineration, but instead to make this whole chain circular? And as you can see here, there are some more um, things that, that, um, that are that can help to make these this circular apart from mechanical recycling and i will go into these technologies a little bit in the next slides so the the main idea of chemical recycling is that you um you actually use the polymer and use some sort of chemical scissors to cut it back into the pieces that it was originally made from the monomers on the way, you can lose the additives, which um, can, can be a problem in mechanical recycling, but can also be toxic if they end up in food products again at the end. Um, for example, uh, certain antioxidants and, and so forth. So you can, the idea is that you can lose them on the way and maybe even recycle those. And then from the monomers or the basic building blocks that were initially made to use the polymer, you can then make a new polymer again, which has the same quality as what you started with in the first place. So the only problem with this is that um, this requires more energy than to just melt the polymer and reshape it, as you might imagine. So you have to break chemical bonds. and for a polymer like PET, which is, for example, used in the, the very uh, common PET bottles, this, this is a little bit easier because you have these oxygen, um, you have oxygen atoms in the backbone. So that means that you have uh, oxygen carbon bonds and those are a little bit easier to break. But for polypropylene and polyethylene, you don't have uh, heteroatoms or oxygen atoms in the backbone. And all of these bonds are very similar. Um, and so there's no preferred point to break this polymer into well-defined pieces. So it's very hard to make the original monomers, the original building blocks again from these polymers. And also uh, breaking these bonds, these carbon-carbon bonds, requires more energy than breaking a carbon-oxygen bond. So um, with, with the first polymer, with polyethylene terephthalate, you can apply thermolysis, and this uh, can be done above uh, 100 degrees Celsius. Uh, it already happens, so if you want to go a bit faster, of course, you need to go a bit higher. But for the second type of polymers, the so polyolefins, polyethylene and polypropylene, you need more than 400 degrees to make this happen. And so this is usually then called pyrolysis. And as you can see, with pyrolysis, we don't go back to the monomers, but typically we go back to the refinery and we start from that point on. So we use it a little bit similarly to crude oil. There's then a third option um, that is called dissolution. It's sometimes not really considered chemical recycling because you don't really break chemical bonds, or at least that's not your goal. But uh, this is how it works. You dissolve the polymer in um, either a single solvent um, or in the single solvent route, you just dissolve it in the solvent and then you uh, precipitate it out by making the solvent evaporate. And uh, later you then, um, then you have to devolatilize all of the solvent to make sure that none of the solvent molecules stay in the resin, which would, uh, of course, um, affect the properties of your final polymer um, a lot. 
Another option is not to crystallize out the um, polymer, but to actually use an anti-solvent, which makes your um, desired polymer precipitate out. And then you can filter it um, out and you can you then also still have to do the last step, the devolatilization, to get rid of any remaining um, solvent molecules. This route, in principle, would allow you to actually separate several different kinds of polymers. And in general, this dissolution and precipitation allows you to remove via filtration in the first step any contaminants such as what, uh, such, as, such as paper or um, metal like aluminum foil that you find in tetra packs. So um, now we, we've talked about these different techniques, but uh, if you are at the refinery here, you might also think about not using the pyrolysis oil such like as crude oil, but you can also just directly make other, um, other molecules from it because you are, you are basically entering the refinery infrastructure, which I'm showing here very briefly. It's, it's a complicated network of many different chemicals, but apart from the, um, from the monomers, ethylene and propylene, that are shown here in the purplish colors, you could, for example, also think about making directly BTX, so um, aromatics, which are shown in orange. And these can, in a lot of cases, have a higher value than propylene and ethylene. And this brings me to my next point, because it depends a lot on what molecules you aim at, how your life cycle analysis which would, will look like. I know a lot of people are wondering about the CO2 footprint of all of these technologies, also in comparison to the common uh, mechanical recycling. And this CO2 footprint is, it depends mostly on your product. And this is really important to keep in mind. So on the very left here, um, I've shown the incineration and incineration with energy recovery. And all of this is from this uh, nice paper that I show here at the bottom, by the way. Um, and it's, nice, it's, it's useful to characterize or to categorize the polymers into three different classes. So uh, first, we have here um, the polyolefins, which are the ones that are hard to, um, to bring back to monomers. And th then we have the monomer forming um, polymers. So that's, that's polymers that are still um, hard to bring back to monomers, but they are a little bit easier to bring back to polymer. That's, for example, polystyrene or um, PMMA. And then at the, at the last class, we have something like PT or uh, polyamides that are actually possible to depolymerize back into the basic building blocks. And so uh, for the incineration, of course, your CO2 footprint, so the CO2 kilograms of CO2 that you produce per plastics is the highest. And this considers not only the um, recycling process, but it also considers the making of the polymer, the transport, and so forth. So it's the whole life cycle of the polymer, considering then at the end of the life different kinds of technologies. So incineration is the worst. If you recover some energy from the incineration, you avoid making the energy in a different way and producing CO2 in that uh, in a different uh, through the different route. So you, uh, your overall CO2 footprint will decrease a little bit. But you can also see some differences. So for example, for um, uh, monomer forming polymers, this is um, actually a little bit higher than for, for the polyolefins. Pyrolysis um, is the most useful for the polyolefins because I said for them it's uh, also hard to, to make monomers again. But it really then depends on what you would aim at with your pyrolysis. So because you enter into the infrastructure, you can use, of course, you can use the pyrolysis oil as fuel. So you can use it as diesel or gasoline. In that case, of course, um, that's not uh, the most preferable way because when you aim at more valuable products like wax or monomers, you will reduce your carbon footprint further. 
but these technologies are not so favorable for the um, the monomer uh, the the polymers that actually make monomers that you can bring back to monomers through, for example, hydrolysis. So that's um, PT and, for example, PLA. And those then are the ones that actually score much better at the end. So um, here with the hydrolysis and the depolymerization, and um, and they don't score so well for the pyrolysis route. So with that, I want to just uh, show you that when we talk about CO2 footprint and talk about the question of which uh, chemical recycling technology is the best, we should also consider that it is, is a different answer for different polymers. And usually we, and this is only shown for pure polymers, but if you look at mix, uh, mixtures of polymers like in multi-layered film and so forth, films and so forth, this question is also answered a bit differently because there we can, for example, only use pyrolysis in a lot of cases. But you can also see that uh, for certain cases, the CO2 footprint is similar for a me mechanical recycling technology um, as for a pyrolysis recycling technology. So um, it really depends on the type of polymer that you consider. So um, now I thought it would be nice to round up this topic of CO2 footprint with a poll question. So um, if we can have that now, that would be nice. We will do, yes. So what we're going to do next is run a poll. This is an interactive poll that you as an audience can tick a box to let us know what you think. When the poll is on screen, it will override the webcam so we won't see Rachel, which will be quiet for a few seconds while the poll is running. But the question we're asking is what percentage of the CO2 footprint of pork is made up of plastic packaging and disposal? Not a great question for the vegans in the audience, uh, but, uh, but pork itself, you may not necessarily think of the plastic as being a contributor to its CO2 emissions. But let's see if you know what percentage is made up. So we're going to launch the poll now. I'll give you just a few more seconds to get your answers in. And I think that's enough. So let's close the poll now. We should get uh, everybody's cameras back up. Welcome back. Uh, so I've got the results in front of me and 36% uh, of you, uh, so a good third of the audience uh, thought it was more than 20%, uh, but the majority, 41% of you thought it was between 10 and 20% and smaller amounts, 14% thought it was five to 10, 9%, just 9% thought it was less than 5%. Inna, what's the real answer? Yeah, so it's interesting that you mentioned vegans or vegetarians, <laughs> because <laughs> I will start um, answering this question with looking at spinach. So for spinach, um, the packaging actually makes up a very high percentage. Um, you have to look at the um, yellowish color and uh, the gray. Um, so, but if we consider spinach, of course, to produce spinach, we might know, or at least some vegetarians might know that it doesn't produce that much uh, CO2. So you can see the total numbers here at the, at the top of the, the overall uh, CO2 production. Uh, if we then go to something like milk, so uh, still not for the vegans, but uh, there the percentage of uh, the packaging actually is is a little bit less. So I think it's also maybe around 5%. So, um, and here you can see that the, the um, light blue color is actually rising a lot. And that's due to the food production. So the cow has to first eat food, then make, uh, make milk from it. And while it is doing that, it is breathing a lot and it is producing also a lot of CO2 because it needs energy. And then if we go to, to the meat products, we really see that the plastic packaging starts to play 
a minor role in the overall CO2 footprint. So the answer is actually less than 5%. And um, the CO2 footprint of pork is uh, not as high as of beef. But um, I think this is maybe another reason uh, for the vegetarians. And it can also be seen that, uh, yeah, for a lot of food products, uh, considering reducing your CO2 footprint, it's better not to eat these things than to actually think about, uh, about what recycling technology you use. And that's where I would like to end with a small message maybe or something to think about because we are of course very concerned about CO2. The newest IPCC um, uh, report makes us very concerned but for plastics maybe there's actually another problem especially if we think about a certain um, products and therefore I think to improve uh, our recycling rates, to boost our recycling rates, maybe you should think about every possible technology that we can get. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Ina. That was such an interesting presentation there on the, the comparison of CO2 rates. That was fascinating, actually. Um, I'd just like to bring Sam back now and we can jump into some of the audience questions. Thanks so much, everyone, for sending in all of your questions. We've got loads, so I'll try and get through as much as possible. And the first question I'm going to start with is quite a big one, and that's around the balance between these technologies, so mechanical versus chemical recycling solutions. Is there a good balance between those, or how might we approach working out what that balance should be? Um, Sam, do you mind if I go to you first? Sure. Um... From a mechanical recyclers perspective, um, it'd probably be biased a little bit. Um, I, I have the vision, the idea that mechanical recycling should lead. Um, it's generally the least energy intensive way of recycling. And we can, with better technologies, with better processes in place, with better segregation, we can chase ever improving qualities and physical properties. And I believe chemical recycling will have a very vital role in helping people achieve recycled content in medical devices um, and medical packaging, where currently we cannot get mechanically recycled materials into them. Um, so I think for the probably everyday materials, mechanical recycling is probably the answer, but for these more niche, perhaps the more um, health related uh, materials and pharmaceuticals, chemical recycling is probably the future there. Um, so I think it will be a balance, it will be a, uh, a question of both of them, but I think mechanical recycling or things like this, the physical um, recycling methods will be uh, the, the leading factor. Great, thank you. Ina, did you have anything to input on that one? Yeah, so it's interesting that um, Sam mentions medical devices because I think that um, yeah, food packaging producers are nowadays also looking uh, a lot to chemical recycling because it allows you to produce virgin grade quality of plastics again. And especially for food grade applications, it's uh, difficult to achieve with mechanical recycling um, because it's hard to remove any remaining additives and it's hard to control the additive content in the end. So um, I think that in addition to uh, taking everything that cannot be mechanical re mechanically recycled and turning it to something like crude oil, crude oil similar product by pyrolysis, I think chemical recycling can also play a role in, um, in getting food grade, grade quality uh, plastics again. But I, I also agree with Sam 100% that we should uh, mechanically recycle as much as possible. And I think it's <laughs> well. Sorry, I just think it's worth noting um, mechanical recycling is employed now for food grade plastics. Um, you know, your milk bottles contain mechanically recycled HDPE, PETs, massively recycled in, into food grade qualities. And I think with more development into, into other packaging types, other material types, I think we can achieve food grid as well from a mechanical perspective. Um, sorry. 
Thanks. Thanks both of you. Interesting you mentioned the medical equipment there. We've had a few questions, one from Lenny, one from Norman, about a um, topical issue around uh, plastics used during the pandemic. So Lenny asked, could chemical recycling be used for single-use masks? And then Norman was talking about lateral flow tests. Is there a better way of dealing with these plastics? Ina, do you want to start with that one? Yeah, so um, I looked a bit into that. I, I saw some uh, publications peak during the pandemic about what to do with all the hygienic masks. And I think that this goes then again back to the problem of that we that we currently have. I think it's one of our biggest problems, but it's like the collecting and sorting of the plastics. And if you nowadays uh, see the recommendations for masks, um, yeah, then it's actually to not dispose it uh, in your plastic ways, but actually dispose it as medical waste. I don't think that anyone can do that, but uh, it will end up in your household waste. So I don't think it's easy to separate out the masks, but in general, if it would be collected with plastics, it would be possible to, at least with chemical recycling, it wouldn't be a big issue because these masks are usually made from polypropylene in the most cases. It can also be polycarbonate, uh, polystyrene or nylon. But all of these plastics shouldn't be a big issue for for uh, something like pyrolysis, for example. Brilliant, thank you. I'm just going to move on to another question here from Han, um, who wonders if the biggest challenge of recycling at the moment is more um, limited by technology, is it economic reasons, or is it policy? And, and is that to do with how much it costs to recycle plastics? Um, Sam, do you want to have a go at that one? Sure. Um, our our targets right now to reach recycled content, uh, sorry, to, to, to reach recycled targets, I apologise, um, it massively relies on export and there is not as much done as you would like to expect really on ensuring that this material is recycled at its export destination. Our government relies on that in order to meet recycling targets so we can pat ourselves on the back at how good we are at recycling and that's a shame economically yes it's difficult polyolefins are very very cheap material and that's why they are so good it's why they are everywhere because they are cheap so it puts a very big challenge on recyclers and reprocessors such as us in order to collect handle sort reprocess these materials and then be competitive on price um, in the past, it was uh, a worry of quality. But as the years have gone on, mechanically recycled products are now perceived to be perfectly good. Um, but it's always an issue of price, definitely, especially with how, you know, we've seen over the recent years, polypropylene reached a record low price just in 2019. But then last year, virgin polymers were double in price. Um, so we're, we're always compared to the virgin price. Um, and we're always expected to be cheaper. Um, so it's it's a balance of all three, um, the sort of leading and improving our recycling. But definitely the biggest one is to give you, Cathy, the same recycling services or collection services as I have, because you can only be 10 miles down the road and some people cannot put blast or PP in a bin, whereas I can. And that's what's going to change over the next decade, unfortunately. It, Unfortunately, it can't be any quicker than that. So it's a big issue which spans a lot of different, um, a lot of different facets, really. Where it needs to be more than just a recycler like me trying to push this. It needs to be a concerted effort, really. Thanks, Sam. And um, for chemical recycling, Ina, would you agree, or is is there another reason um, t that's holding back um, implementation of these technologies? Um, so, yeah, last year we, we published a review on, on the topic um, on chemical recycling, uh, summarizing all the different technologies. And one of the things we wanted to do was not to look only as, at the science side, because of course I'm a scientist, so it's easier for me to look at the science side of things than to look at the, um, yeah, the, the, the application. But um, we interviewed a couple of startups and I think that most of the um, 
technologies that are implemented are at the, the startup level at the moment. So we have a couple of pilot plans and a lot of them mentioned um, regulations as, as one of the biggest hurdles for them. And I think the tides have turned a little bit on the commercial um, problem because uh, I think a lot of bigger packaging producers are now interested uh, in these technologies and that helps. And because we also looked into old reports of uh, chemical recycling, so there was a lot of um, a lot of stuff happening in the 90s. So we found reports of a lot of pilot plants already being built or in use. But um, when we tried to contact those companies again, most of them were, didn't exist anymore or uh, then it was part of a bigger company and they said, yeah, we stopped that because it was not commercially viable. We were competing with crude oil um, or virgin plastics uh, prices. So I think nowadays it's a little bit less the commercial problem uh, because the uh, also yeah, demand for recycled content is increased, but it's it's a lot of uh, problems with regulations. And another issue that they mentioned was um, to get the feedstock, so to get the plastic waste, because it's not like crude oil that you get it with a big uh, ship and there's an existing infrastructure and you get it locally to your refinery, but you have to get it from different places in the country. And uh, I'm working in the Netherlands and it's a very small country. Some people even say that the Netherlands is just too small to get enough uh, plastic waste of the quality that they need. So it depends a bit, I think. Brilliant, thank you. Um, just to say, I'm aware we've passed the scheduled end of this webinar. There's just so many interesting questions. I hope you don't mind hanging on for a few more um, our speakers. And um, there will be a recording if you do need, if any of our attendees do need to head off. Um, so we've had a question from uh, Michael, Karen, and a couple of other um, attendees as well. And this is. Are there any groups of polymers or plastics which are particularly difficult to recycle using either one of these techniques? Are there, is there any which, you know, is there a possibility we could recycle all plastics? Or are there always going to be a few which, which are going to be difficult? Um, Sam, can I start with you again? Yeah. Um, our methods that we employ rely on the material being a thermoplastic, ultimately. If this material can be softened to such a degree to reform and to, to turn into some, something else, great. It can be applied. Um, you may have to um, look at different ways of processing, such as PET, must be very, very dry, same with nylon. Um, but thermosets, that's something different completely. Um, we can get examples of cross-linked polyethylene in this plant, and if that gets in one of our lines, that's stuck. <laughs> We have to disassemble the extruder, take the screws out and take a hammer and chisel to it. Um, so to us, very basically, I think if it's thermoplastic, a process can be applied in order to recycle it mechanically. Ina, for you, uh, for the chemical processes you're talking about, are there any polymers which are no-goes? Um, yeah, there's PVC, for example, polyvinyl chloride, so the chlorine does uh, give problems. I have heard a lot about some solutions to this problem already, so, and for certain chemical recycling technologies, it's less of a problem. There are even chemical recycling technologies that are spe specifically targeted towards PVC. So it's, but it's um, one of the usual suspects, let's say, because people say it can now form chloric gas, which of course is <laughs> very uh, bad, and it can form hydrochloric acid, which can uh, lead to corrosion in the reactor. But there are ways to get rid of it uh, after the reactor. And uh, a lot of companies say that nowadays they don't have a problem with it anymore if it's in decent amounts. Thank you. Thank you both. OK, I think this is going to be our last question. So we've run over a little bit and lots of people have been asking this. Um, what is the best way as citizens that we can help with plastic recycling? Um, Ina, do you want to start on this one? Oh, that's a difficult one, I think, <laughs> because uh, it, it depends. I mean, of course, uh, I'm a 
fanatic with sorting, so I sort my own plastic uh, very much, and I even sometimes clean it before I throw it away. But this is um, not very rational, I would say, because it has to come from the authorities, because there needs to be a good sorting system in place. And if there is 2% of the households that don't sort properly, it doesn't work in some cases. So, um, yeah. It's, it's difficult to say, but I think it's good to get informed and to make your voice heard to the government and in any way possible. And to, yeah, just, I think being informed is the, the most important thing on this topic. And yeah, don't start uh, saying plastic is altogether bad and we should only do this one recycling technology or that one recycling technology but make informed choices and be aware of what you know brilliant sam do you have any final words on that i think as i alluded to earlier you can have a different waste infrastructure than i can and we could be almost neighbors and that is the real issue isn't it because i think people do want to do the best thing, they do want to recycle, but ultimately you can only put it in the bins that you're given from your local councils, your local authorities. Um, so I, I completely reiterate Ina's um, point to make your voice heard. If you think your council isn't providing the adequate service, we can improve it. Um, because I, I feel people do use these services when they are available, and it's very easy for bigger companies and organisations to blame people that they don't sort well. Um, whereas I think of it the complete other way. If people have the opportunity, they, they will take it. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, I'll finish there with the questions. I'd just like to say again, thank you so much to both of our excellent speakers today. And thanks to all of our wonderful audience members and for all those questions that you sent through today. Um, I'll just quickly remind you of the resources I mentioned, our current and upcoming explainers, which will be found on the website at the link on your screen. Um, we've had a few questions in about educational resources. If you go to the teaching and learning tab of the RSC website, you'll be able to navigate to our education website, which has lots of information and resources on there. And as Ben said, there will also be a recording of this webinar um, available if you want to share that as well. Um, we're running these webinars every few months as part of a series and the next one will be on plastics and the environment. So check back on the Chemistry World website for news about that. Um, and that's thank you from me. Thank you very much, Cathy. So a final reminder, there will be a recording made available. We'll send that to you in a couple of days time. And we'll also send a certificate to say thank you to everybody who attended live. Uh, as Cathy said, there are more of these coming up. If you haven't already got a Chemistry World account, please go to chemistryworld.com and register an account. That means that as long as you tick the box to say we can get in touch, we'll be able to send you an email about all of the upcoming events like this. Uh, it, we do a, a variety of different uh, online interactive events, a bit like this one, some looking into more academic areas, some looking into more instrumentation areas, but there's a lot of them coming up. So uh, do keep an eye out in your inbox for that. But that's it. Thank you uh, also to Rachel for joining us. And of course, thank you to Cathy uh, for hosting and organising today's event. I'm Ben Valsler, Chemistry World's Digital Editor, and we'll see you again for another Chemistry World webinar very soon. Thanks again.